Welcome to Philosophy 15. I'm Scott Aiken. I'm Robert Talese. And these are uh, philosophical discussions, unscripted, between two philosophy professors. Uh, we are the co-authors of Why We Argue and How We Should, A Guide to Political Disagreement. And today we're going to talk um, about a unique kind of fallacy, a kind of new dialectical fallacy that we've been seeing. Yeah, so what got us thinking about this was um, uh, Scott and I had been independently noticing, given some of the um, the philosophers that we, you know, the, the, the classic philosophers that we spend a lot of time with, particularly uh, classic American pragmatist philosophers, um, a certain kind of, might at first call it kind of like a metaphilosophical fail, right? Um, where what one will find often um, uh, is um, a kind of seemingly deliberate, maybe, asymmetry between yeah. the philosophical burdens one imposes on um, one's philosophical opposition um, and the philosophical burdens one imposes on one's own view. So it looks as if here's a standard way in which this seemingly, this, well, the seemingly metaphilosophical or methodological error runs. You hold the opposition to super high philosophical standards, show that the opposition cannot meet those standards, and then articulate your view as if you've cleared the decks and now there are no standards in play. Right uh, now, all uh, now that I've shown you, think about Peirce on Descartes, or Good. or Dewey on Kant, uh, or William James on idealism. Like now that I've shown you that these other programs are failures. Let's leave it at that. We don't have to get into whether they are failures. That's the whole other question. But the argument is, now that I've shown you that these other programs are failures. There are no philosophical competitors in play any longer, so I just get to report my philosophical view as if that were sufficient to vindicate right. it. You're right? the only you're the only game in you're town. The only now. Game, like, you, right. <laughs> so we might even think of it as sort of a, a metaphilosophical error of the sort of clearing the decks fallacy. Now that the decks are cleared, there's no philosophical right. predators in view. So I don't have to meet any dialectical burdens with response to them. Now, what makes it, I, I think, an interesting metaphilosophical error is that it, it looks to me based in a philosophical premise that um, is at the very least questionable. It seems to me to be a, a premise that I think has got to be false, but maybe we don't have to go that strong. It's at least questionable, which is which runs like this. For some philosophical program or view or the collection of views or project, um, uh, P, call it, um, if it can be shown that P's positive philosophical claims fail, then P has been um, uh, P has been evacuated of, or P has been sort of uh, uh, deprived of all of its critical force with respect to the competitors of P. So think about, for example, uh, the way that some, um, I think, uh, uh, uncareful um, criticisms of Marx go. And again, you could see this problem without having to uh, attribute any particular T's or F's under any particular claim, this the following looks to me like a kind of error. Show that Marx's positive conception of the of economics, his positive economic views or his views in economics are false. Take yourself to have shown that the capacity for Marxist analyses to be critical of norms in a capitalist society, that those are also diffused. Right. You don't have to answer any of their objections this, once you've shown right. that their view is false. Good. Right. One more is, is, yep. is even more prevalent. Think about how some, again, I think uh, fast and loose criticisms of utilitarianism go. Right? It's like you, ra you, you raise the nth version of, you know, uh, uh, you know, the ticking time bomb or the, you, you, you raise whatever favorite counterexample to utilitarianism you've got. Right. Then you say, oh, 
Well, utilitarianism has been knocked out of contention. Therefore, there are no utilitarian driven criticisms of anti-utilitarian views that need to be responded to. That looks to me like just a metaphysical yeah. error. Right. I'm sorry, a, a metaphysical metaphysical error. Right. In, in so, many cases, it's metaphysical. It's, it, right. Yeah, there, are, there might be metaphysical <laughs> consequences. Yeah. Um, so those look like, so maybe a clarification then, because uh, it looks like we have two related phenomena. Yeah. One is the view that once you've criticized, um, we'll put it this way. Uh, we'll state a kind of a metaphilosophical kind of view, which is that uh, all views have got benefits and costs. You pay attention to the costs of another view, and in showing that, you show that the view is maybe, at the very least, prima facie non-viable. And as a consequence, A, you don't have to act like you have to own up to the costs of your own view. Moreover, you don't have to show, you don't have to answer the objections from the, from the, from the alternative view about your costs. Right. Right. So, yeah. So it looks like those are two different phenomena. Right. You can have costs for your view that don't require another philosophical view to point them out. Or you could have you might even say something like maybe the maybe the other philosophical view is right about the fact that you've got costs and you don't have to have that philosophical view to see that they're costs. Right. So you might say something like you don't have to be a utilitarian to think that you might say that something is painful as a cost or <laughs> something right. like that. Right. right. Uh, so. Uh, so as a consequence, it looks like these are these are related but separate phenomena, but they're still, you might say, of the umbrella class of clearing the decks. One is, you might say, just consistency of, of standards of scrutiny, right? You can just imagine someone just saying something like, well, look, because Descartes couldn't defeat the skeptic, it doesn't. The Cartesian system just doesn't work, and so I'm going to have a much lower standards epistemic system, uh, and they can do it. And you'd say, but the Cartesian, the Cartesian epistemology can live up to the lower standards <laughs> requirement, right? A whole lot better than it can, right? It's like neither of us beat the skeptic, but once you lower the standards, the Cartesian system still is able to meet those lower lower standards. So that's the first line. Um, the second one is one that just says. Well, look, it looks like uh, once I've shown that that system, that philosophical view is, is, uh, has, got, has got deep and maybe insuperable problems, that doesn't mean that the critical lines that it has of other views are, deb are fully debunked, right? You might call one a sort of uh, an error of debunking. Once you've debunked a view, it doesn't mean that some of their critical lines are false, right? right. Or, a, or dialectical misses. Um, because you might say some debunking strategies are ones that can say something like, uh, it, it, once you debunk a, once you debunk a view, uh, it may not mean that we've got all the positive epistemic status that you would have for the, for the, for the view, but it, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're not, that it doesn't have a kind of a bite by other means, right? You could say, well, look, I mean, I've debunked the, you know, might say, um, uh, I've debunked uh, rational intuition, say for example, right? But we still have reflective endorsement, right? <laughs> right? Or right. we've got right, we've got a lot of other means to think our way into similar kinds of thoughts. Right. So, so maybe there's two yeah. then. So there's the yeah. clearing the decks problem, right? And then this sort of fast and loose with the yeah. difference between debunking and refuting or something. Great. Yeah, that's right. 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 So it looks as if in the second case. Uh, one is merely shown that part of a competitor view is vulnerable to criticism and then takes the entire resources of the view, both positive and critical, right. to have been somehow undermined or diffused. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe one thought could be like, so, sometimes the positive parts of philosophical views are ways to explain phenomena that otherwise are unproblematic, right? So you might say, look, we'll go with your Marxist example. One feature of the Marxist line is that like, look, it looks like there's a lot of alienation, right? Like we needed the vocabulary of alienation and maybe the Marxist fix for it. And maybe that gets debunked, right? right. But the phenomenon of alienation <laughs> it may need theory, and maybe Marx's theory it can't fully explain it all, or maybe it's got a problem. But it's still like by saying, "Look, Marxist philosophy has got a pro got a, this deep and separable problem." Doesn't mean that you don't have to pay attention to alienation problems, right? right. It looks like the Marxist is out to ex to to start with something that. It looks like you, you say, like, look, I don't need philosophy to see that problem. Philosophy just allows me to make explicit what that is, right? Right. Um, so it is good. So it does look then, especially um, 
puzzling that both of these um, errors are so prevalent among the pragmatists. Yeah, why is that? Uh, now, I think that it's, uh, we have a term for that. Well, well but, but hold on, before yeah. we get to the term, yeah. it's like, because it looks, I mean, let's say we'll say about why it's odd that it's so prevalent among them right. is because you would think that, um, well, we know that in their better moods, uh, metaphilosophically, the pragmatist is always in a comparative game. Right, the pragmatist is is maybe because this is a maybe this is tightly connected to fallibilist views. Maybe this is tightly connected to experimentalist views, or ameliorative views. Any of these ways in which pragmatists characterize their program make philosophy itself intrinsically a comparative thing. Right, there is no winner. There's just the best thing you've got so far, and right. the best thing you've got so far is essentially right intrinsically a comparative judgment. Yes. Right. Um, there is no sort of clearing the threshold and a non, in a non-comparative sense, that's the game is won. So that's how the pragmatists speak out of one side of their mouths. That's exactly right. But then whenever they do, but then whenever they make the comparison with, you might say, me, the metaphilosophical comparison. Right. They say, well, we're the only game in town because that's the only, we're the only ones who say that. Or we're the only ones who do this right. And as a consequence, everybody gets the back of the hand. Right. Um, which just looks, I mean, part of it has to do with the fact that it's a, I mean, look, now we're going to get a little bit off, off of the topic of this, of this fallacy is that pragmatism is for the most part a metaphilosophy first program, right. right? And that it's got a view about how to do philosophy, right? And once you've got this view about how to do philosophy, right? A lot of the other views are going to sound less like philosophy and more like noise, Right, like you're going to say, like, yeah, they, they they've got a, the wrong view about how philosophy shows up. They've got the wrong view about how meaning works, um, what knowledge what, is, not, right? right? All of these sorts of things, and so they're all going to look like either hopeless cases, deeply confused programs, um, in the service of something objectionable. Well, right, and I guess interestingly, um, in Dewey's case, yes, right, the competitors to his version of pragmatism are these historically curious but nonetheless obsolete right right um, strands of thinking that have their full explanation in premises about right. pre-Darwinian states of society, right. pre-Darwinian right. understandings right. of science. Right. Failures of science and failures of class. Good, right? Good, good, good. Right? Because that, that's, that's how, the, theory, that's how right. the spectator theory of knowledge shows up. It's, right? Exactly. Like, so it's a class view for Dewey. And I just don't know that at the end of the day that that way of running the metaphilosophy first kind of pragmatism can be consistent with fallibilism. Right. It's kind of self-sealing. Um, that seems exactly right. Yeah. And so as a consequence, it ends up being a kind of pragmatist triumphalism. Yeah, that's the word. Yeah. That's, the, that's the term. <laughs> that's the term. Uh, right, where pragmatism winds up being the only game in town. Right. While at the same time, it presents itself as um, a, a neutral arbiter among all the different games that are being played. Yeah. When in fact, it's got its thumb on the. It's got its thumb, thumb on the scale. scale. Yeah. yeah. Philosophy fifteen, folks. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time.